Uh, and uh, I just want to talk a little bit about the journey that I've been on over the last few years uh, with mobility. Um, first of all, this 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 is you know my great idea in getting people to um, participate, and I thought we were going to have everyone who was there go and get one of the drawing tools and go and put a mark on the map to show where you are. So. Right at this particular point, I would like Andy and Malcolm to go and get themselves a drawing tool and put a little X marks a spot and your initials on the map in a colour that can be seen. So that's in the recording. I'm going to do the same. Uh, there's a there's a, an X has marked one spot. That's great. I know you can hear me, Malcolm. So uh, I wonder if Andy can hear me at all. So well, if, yes, there he goes. Excellent. Right, so I'm going to go in and um, put a little um, pen stroke there down in Victoria and I'm going to put my initials there to show where I am. So we, we are getting a bit of a picture of where people are around the world. Very good. Okay, so um, that's recorded for posterity now. I'm going to put um, Andy's initials up there for him so we know that that was him that was up there in the corner. There he goes. Easy to remember, AB. All right, okay, let's go on. This is where I come from, as you can see. I take him on a bright sunny day. I work in a, um, a government-run secondary school of about 950 students uh, in central Victoria. You can see the location down there uh, and you've also got uh, a shot of some of the kids in my classroom. <clears throat> What's next? Where did this journey all begin? This, this um, sl one slide here is usually something that I can spend a whole afternoon talking about but uh, this whole use of uh, mobility in our school started with writing a new curriculum program called Personalising Learning, uh, in which we rewrote the curriculum and combined together a number of subjects in order to um, work on these four pillars of learning, um, the learners being central, uh, using more e-learning, to get kids a love of learning and to get them to work into communities. And there's a whole curriculum behind that, um, but an opportunity came along using Stavis. Um, they moved over into having a, a mobile platform, and so working with them in Apple, uh, a whole class set of iPod touches were delivered to me in mid-2008 at the same time the App Store opened, so we were very early days. And what the beauty of it was was the mobile device was ideal for personalising learning and giving every student their own personal learning device. Uh, and of course we haven't stopped ever since. So it hasn't been a novelty, no it hasn't worn off. And the reason why it fits so well into as a personal learning program is because of these words um, used here to describe the, the, the mobility. So you know, context aware. We'll talk about that briefly a little bit later on. Very portable, informal, pervasive, personal opportunity. And it's learning on tap, tap for my kids uh, anytime, anywhere. The other, one of the other things that's great about the um, about using the iPod Touches and the, the research shows this is a um, just a tiny excerpt from a brilliant uh, book I've downloaded to my um, Kindle app recently on my iPad from Clark Quinn uh, called Designing M Learning. And he talks there in a lot of detail about how our brains work and what our cognitive processes are and, and how the mobile device is just the perfect augmenting tool for our, for our own operations. Uh, in that we are able to pattern match well and we're able to, to monitor the decisions that we make throughout the day well, but all those sorts of rote operations uh, that we just don't remember, all of a sudden having a mobile device with us, it really augments that ability to learn. And so we can teach the kids that as well, the kids in our care or any adults or anyone who's, who's working with them. Now at this particular point, I was going to run a bit of a poll, it's gonna, it's gonna be, and I was going to put the results of the poll up here on the slide, but um, if you can see over there, you've got a choice of A, B, C, and D. 
if, if you would like to indicate one of those four choices, which one of those four, Malcolm, you would say was one of the biggest barriers to um, just pick one just at random just to just to appease me so that I can put the little thing up. That would be great. So if you want to choose A, B, C or D and you do that just by clicking on the letter down over here and that will go up there. So I wonder if you can hear me. Oh, we've got D. That's excellent. And you know, I am going to um, pick something myself just to make the graph a little bit more interesting and I'm going to go with this one here and then I'm going to bring those results up so that we can uh, see those results on the screen. And so my idea was to run that poll and see what <laughs> the poll isn't, isn't going to be great. But perhaps people who are looking at this later on can have a look at one of those. And I was going to do a second one as well. Um, what about any of these things here? Um, unfortunately that image is moved as the slides have been uploaded. So that choice D was learning or distraction. You know, is, is there a concern? Is it a learning tool or a distraction? So I'm going to um, get you to have another choice. We've got C for that one. Teacher PD, a big thing. And I'm going to go with um, I'm going to go there with D, and we'll run that poll up again. So again, a great meaningful poll. But you can see how Illuminate can work very well um, by putting those choices on the screen, and uh, you get a bit of feedback from your audience to see how things are going. So thank you very much for participating in that, Malcolm. It's great to have you. All right, this is this is reality. I'm just I'm just talking how it is today. I use mobile devices; they are part of my life every single day. Uh, they have been in the classroom um, for the past three years, and th this is the starting point we have. I'm working a lot with students in Year Eight who are 13, 14 years old, and their parents will buy them uh, an iPod Touch um, for Christmas for their birthdays, and the next thing they're bringing it to me to put onto the um, onto the network, and I'll have a look through to see what they might have on their devices. And the screen in front of you is pretty much characteristic of what you find um, from the girls or the boys. And so you look, and you understand why perception arises um, from the other teachers, from families, from the community you're involved in. Uh, that something like the iPod Touch is purely a distraction, is purely a gaming device, and so. We really need to change that perception by by using our professionalism as educators and you know our so-called ability you know in the year 2011 to integrate ICT into our teaching and learning, and yet kids have got devices in their pockets, and this is what we're letting them use them for, and our only answer to it is banning them, and I think that's a real shame. And uh, that's very much what I'm part of here in Australia and around the world is changing that perception. And it's it's added to by this, and I haven't pulled any punches here. Um, you know, this is the kind of thing that I have um, in my school with uh, arguments in the classroom and the playground all the time uh, now being carried on to the mobile devices uh, or, or Facebook, of course, when they go home. But I mean, let's get real about this. Uh, before mobile devices, it used to be a pen and a piece of paper, didn't it? It used to get passed, didn't it? Secreted around the classroom in your hand until the teacher finally intercepted it and pulled it out and had it in front of them. So there's absolutely nothing new under the sun here. Uh, and we certainly didn't remove pen and paper from students in, in order to uh, manage that um, situation. And so this is what we find with mobility in our kids in the classroom. They've, they've all got them in their pockets at all times. They're always messaging, they want to listen to music, they want to play games, they want to use them inappropriately. And as a general rule, they're completely unaware of how they might be used in education. Well, this is our starting point. And, and I'm sure this is a starting point for many people around the world who might look at this presentation. This is where the teachers are coming in. Some are completely anti-mobile devices. Some get the idea that uh, you can let kids listen to music in class or they they can check the time or they might use it as a calculator and uh, if, you, if you ask them, that will be the three main answers that come up. Um, there are some who try some short activities 
uh, you know, they know they can get them get on the internet and they can search for a, for a topic in a science class or something like that. So there are some activities that way in the early days, and then there are some who are really keen to to have a look at uh, broadening the scope of these devices and using them in the learning. But when it comes down to administration, uh, it certainly has the IT departments and schools scratching their heads, and it really takes someone like me or someone. Um, with with a lot of um, time, well, not, I haven't got a lot of time on my hand, but someone who's really prepared to make this work, to set up iTunes accounts and sync things, etc. So that's something certainly to consider in your locality, whether it be a school or any other institution. Well, what do the families think of it? The families think, um, okay, then I'm going to buy my kid a mobile phone. I'm going to buy them an iPod Touch. Uh, in year eight at Shepherd and High School, uh, still every day, including today, including yesterday, I have kids coming to me with new iPod touches to be put onto the network, which I do uh, at lunch times. It's a lunchtime job that I have. Um, you know, I'd say we're somewhere between 30 and 50 percent of the kids owning their own devices outside of what we have at the school. And if I can just come back to what we're doing at the school at the moment. Um, we had one-to-one -one iPod touches in 2008 and 2009 for my class in year eight to do a lot of research. And then we moved on and used, we used two class sets at the moment um, across the school and they can be borrowed out by anyone. Plus we've got a, a large percentage, I'd say 35% of the whole school also have an iPod touch in their pockets. Uh, on top of that, we've got a one-to-one -one laptop program, and so that's really overtaken the, the time to drive one-to-one uh, -one learning at the school. But it does not remove the mobile devices, so it's still very much part of uh, what we need to be including in our IT environment. The families don't understand that these devices that they're buying have got any kind of educational value. They buy them generally to babysit their kids, to put music on it, to let them play games. Uh, and the other thing is that uh, they, they're using the mobile devices, the mobile phones to contact their children. So, so that's the starting point. Okay, that's the starting point. Um, and I'm just having a look at some of the comments made there. Cyberbullying can be worse than old style bullying. It, it, it opens it up to more people. It, it, I don't know if it's any worse, um, but it certainly makes it more accessible. Uh, and you know, we we are certainly um, delivering a comprehensive uh, program to our year eights on appropriate behaviour, uh, cyberbullying. I pull a lot from. Um, CyberSmart in Australia and also DigiZen in the UK have got some brilliant resources and we put together a few things and really get the kids thinking about it. So that's that runs for us at this year level. Um, also have the kids involved in uh, an international blogging competition um, through EduBlogs which is just fantastic where they really learn to communicate with people outside their peers and uh, they learn their, their, to mind their P's and Q's a bit better that way. Um, and so that's that's the sort of a starting point. And if you if you want to have a broader look at what people are saying about mobile learning around the world, you might um, refer to this um, web link that I've got on this slide. Um, I was in Abilene in Texas for ACU Connected back in uh, late February, early March this year, and a number of people from around the world were there and. Uh, it was great to um, to be able to contribute to this short piece that goes for about six minutes of people around the world talking about um, mobility and where it stands at the moment and some of the issues that have been confronted. And so that's well worth a look after you've finished uh, watching this recording to come back in and um, and to take a break there and, and have a look at what's being said on that on that um, short state of mobile learning. Now. As a result of all the work that I've done, and look, I, I'm not spending a lot of time today talking about what I've actually done in the classroom. If, if anyone out there would like me to do a presentation on what we've actually done in the classroom, um, I've got hundreds of hours of um, deliveries and workshops that um, I've got available. So uh, there's there's no end of resources that we've used in, in numeracy, in literacy, in um, English as a second language support, in uh, working um, 
with kids with particular subjects. So we're doing rainforest at the moment. So this afternoon we were using uh, an app called uh, Britannica Kids Rainforest. Uh, and then as I was leaving today, um, the teacher needed to set up touches tomorrow um, for a senior history class because they were recording responses to questions, uh, essay questions. Um, I've got numeracy classes using them to understand numbers this week. Uh, and um, I've run a workshop for our humanities department on a whole range of things that they can do for um, medieval uh, times and Egyptian times and uh, disasters and, and so it goes on. I mean, quite frankly, they're applicable to, to anything both within the school environment and to teach the kids to extend that learning beyond the classroom. So enough of that. Uh, in tonight. Uh, I'd like to introduce you to some of my great colleagues around Australia. Um, we all met on Twitter probably during 2009. Um, we were all starting to work with, um, I've been working with iPod Touches for a year or so. Dion had heard about me and had flown up from Tasmania um, to the school and uh, and then online on Twitter, people who were talking about M learning, um, these these faces kept on cropping up. So you know, December 2009, I said to them, you know, you guys are amazing. You should all get together and really, you know, have a movement for teachers, teachers who are in the classroom to to tell other people about what our responsibilities are for, um, you know, just turning the tide on on mobility and mobile learning as being a distraction and something which is all about cyberbullying into something which is absolutely amazing and powerful and is is the way of the future and it's our it's our role to embrace that and so these great people here all said yes and we um, we ran our first uh, slide to learn in uh, in Shepparton at my school last July uh, July 2010 that was hugely successful and the requests came in. Uh, and so six months, eight months later, whatever it is, we've done it again and we've just run our second um, slide to learn uh, with about 200 people at, on the University of the Sunshine Coast in Queensland, amazing experience. Um, anyone who watches this presentation later on, um, just note that uh, web address down the bottom there and please go and join our meeting. Uh, there are about five or six hundred people there now and if you've got any questions about mobility and learning, uh, that's a place to ask it uh, and um, so well with a look. Who knows where slides, the slide to learn is going to be in 2012 or beyond, but I do believe you will hear about it again. Uh, we had a great time. These are just a couple of the shots that I quickly put together. Um, the main people in the team, uh, one of our team members had a baby. The, the couple of days before, so she was unable to be with us. Uh, but uh, we've also really taken on board and befriended Tony Vincent from Learning in Hand over in um, in Arizona in the States, and he flew over from America, and we all stayed together. and uh, He presented a number of sessions and was part of the workshops there, which was brilliant. Uh, and we also had a lot of international presentations as well. That that shot up there in the back corner, you can see that was brilliant. That was me just in training and uh, setting up for a workshop with um, Dr. William Rankin, Bill Rankin from ACU in Texas and also with Abdul Chomham from ESA Academy up in Bolton in the UK who were doing presentations for me via Skype or iChat at different times but it just so happened we were all online at the same time and so that shot there is me in Queensland um, with, with Bill in the UK and uh, I'm sorry, Abdul in the UK and Bill in Texas all at the same time which was uh, just amazing and there's just a, a bit of a panorama of some happy folk there. So get on to the Ning, have a look. Um, it's the place to be certainly in Australia for discussions on mobility and learning. Now what I presented there this year was um, a, a session called The Seventh Sense and I'm very interested in the whole concept of the mobile device being something that is with us 24 hours a day and augmenting our learning and, and sort of being there in time. And this is this is the kind of message I want to get across both to teachers and to kids to, to teach them that, you know, the power that they've got in their hands. 
and uh, again, um, I'm not going to go into much detail on this session today. Um, it, it, it went for half a day, it could have gone all day and we talked about um, all means of contextual learning and uh, the ability to sense and to, to bring in data to the mobile device to augment your learning. If you've ever got any more questions um, for me about that, please don't hesitate to contact me. Uh, some of the ideas that I went about um, were just understanding mobility because there's a, there's a lot of perception from people who are first looking at it, you know, trying to scale down, um, you know, learning programs so that they fit on a small screen rather than a large screen and, you know, if you're, if you're looking to do that, uh, you're missing the point altogether, just absolutely altogether and so that cartoon from uh, Float Mobile Learning, they've got a, uh, a great website you know, it's not a choice between do you use the computer or the mobile device because the mobile device creates um, a whole different context for learning altogether. Um, and this this quote here um, from Professor Mark Sharples from the University of Nottingham, he has a, a paper that has been published called Education in the Wild a couple of years ago, brilliant reading to try and understand um, some of the, the ideas and the concept of um, contextual learning and um, you know, using the mobile device to, to um, make learning um, happen in its place and in its time. And, and a very clear message there that it's not the, the technical, um, it's not technical issues that are holding us back but social issues because even working with slides to learn with people around the world, even to this particular point, there's very little talk of that um, learning outside the classroom and that the augmentation between the, the device and the user and that, that contextual learning. And so that's something I'm very keen to explore further and, and have done uh, with that, um, that work there called the Seven Sense. Again, any more questions on that in the future, please don't hesitate to ask. I met Mark Sharples uh, a couple of years ago in Orlando in Florida at MLearn and it uh, was an absolute privilege to talk to him and hope to get up to Nottingham um, in the near future when I'm shifting to the UK and, uh, and uh, see him in his home environment there. Now just based on the, uh, the kinds of um, experiences that I've had, you know, if, if I had to give you some guidelines as to what you should really be looking for if you're looking at implementing any kind of mobile learning in your, in your educational institution, in your workplace or wherever you might be, um, these are, I couldn't cut it down to any less than nine points. Uh, yeah, I'm just reading there, Malcolm says that he's interested about learning in professional networks of peers and others and that, that's certainly, um, you know, where I'm trying to move is getting out of the classroom. It's something that's with you at all times and all places. So these points here really go, go across the board. Um, certainly wherever you work, wherever you're working with mobility, allow it, don't ban it, don't be suspicious of it start to find out what it can actually do and you know, find a, a device that is going to be um, suitable to deliver everything that, that you need. But for me at Shepherd and High School, um, the iPod Touch has been utterly invaluable because it is a, a very easy platform to manage and to deliver um, really engaging material and there is no barrier to me worrying about um, you know, different kids' devices and can they do this and can they do that. Once you start doing that, you really um, are putting a big barrier in place for yourself to, to manage your time in our, in our circumstance in any case. Uh, you're really not delivering mobile learning if you've got a class set that you're wheeling a trolley out, you know. Um, if you're really serious about mobile learning, um, you know, you're not looking at getting breakfast carts and thinking things up. You're really looking at getting devices into the hands of kids like one to one, 24 hours a day. Um, so once you get that idea of contextual learning, 
you'll see that it's not just something you wheel out into a classroom and get an activity going because that's just a replacement for a desktop computer and not the point at all. It has its it has its time and its place in certain circumstances, but that's really only um, the tip of the iceberg. Um, and I'm just going to stop for a moment and have a look at how how is this tool um, with active Indigenous uh, with ethnic and refugee kids and others of disadvantaged backgrounds. Fantastic. You know, they think all their Christmases have come, you know, if they've got access to a mobile device. In my first year of using uh, mobile devices and, and even still, but certainly when I was running uh, the one-to-one, -one, I've got a lot of ESL kids in my classes. We have a lot of students from Afghanistan. Um, we have a lot of students from Iraq uh, and their literacy levels are very low and Providing a tool which allows them to listen to audio books or to have a dictionary or for them to record their voices and listen to themselves back or to take notes or to to have an extra way of connecting with the language barrier in the classroom is extremely powerful and um, you know really just brought tears to my eyes a number of times and also with kids who've got very low literacy levels. Uh, you identify those obviously through the testing done in schools and then you can personalise whatever they've got on their iPod touch, um, you know, for, for special spelling games or, um, you know, some, for some voice recordings or, or whatever resources that you want to put together to target those particular kids. That's really easily done. So, look, massively useful. Um, you know, you, you take that device and you, you look at the person that you're trying to help, you look at the person whose life you're trying to improve through learning and through technology and the mobile device and of course, you know, in, in my environment, you know, the iPod Touch, um, it, it works every single time. Now did I miss one of those points? Yes, I did. Number three, overlooked time and time and time again. Um, you know, people want you to do all these great things, but um, teacher professional development is is not supported anywhere near enough. And I think, you know, what people don't get their heads around in the schools is that they're trying to find big blocks of time to release everybody to have a workshop. Um, and that's we all know that that's pretty much impossible. But you know, even even um, in my school and many schools that I've visited. Um, you know, a solution to that is to employ somebody in the school who is freed up from their teaching load and whose responsibility is to go around and target individual teachers and do that sort of just-in-time learning and help them prepare for their classes or, or help them put together some project-based learning, some challenge-based learning, some, um, some ideas using the mobile devices and it's much more accessible that way. I, I would like to see schools around the world um, Seeing the value in that, and you know, seeing the value in um, 30 periods a week, which is which is our timetable, that someone is employed to work with other teachers to serve that purpose. It's a shame that um, that that's not seen as a value in many cases. And uh, we're always talking about running out of uh, you know PD time. You know, that's just one thought that I have. I've seen that in a few places that I've visited around the world. I remember visiting a small. Catholic primary school in um, San Jose in California and working there, uh, the Holy Spirit School with a gentleman, gentleman called um, Jonathan McCart and um, the school had decided, you know, that, that he was valuable enough to employ full time to work with teachers to implement, you know, one to one program in their school and the result was brilliant and quite frankly I think more people should do it. Um, <coughs> some other points, textbooks and books and books being on the book list, you know, there's a major change underway at the moment. We're not all the way there, but it's certainly something that you don't want to take your eye off the ball. You want to think of a strategy, um, you know, whether you're moving things onto student-owned notebooks or whether you're going to uh, use iPads. <coughs> uh, you really need to keep your eye on the ball and what's going on with um, publishing, the publishing world and having a look at how that fits into your uh, strategies. Uh, you, you need to break down the perceptions that your community has, as I pointed out earlier, that the devices are, are for games and for distractions and for bullying. Um, once you show them something else, once you show them something different, um, they start to say, well, you know, 
you know, maybe it could be good and they, they start to see their kids talking about their devices in terms of what they're learning in the classroom. Um, but it's our role as educators to turn that around, you know, so you know, we've got to stop banning things and we've got to start taking that approach. Um, we're just going to stop for a minute and have another read of Malcolm's questions and he says, what does the research say about critical success factors for introducing new tech and pedagogies into school systems beyond innovators and early adopters. Well, this is this is what I'm telling you here. These these nine points. I put these up at um, the beginning uh, when we introduced Slide to Learn in uh, Queensland there a month or so ago, and you know people you know copied them down. This this is a collection of of the suggestions that I'm making that you should have a look at based on that research. Um, and Daddy says their research says reliable technology. So it will always work. And I'll tell you what, the, the, the iPod Touch always works, all the time. Um, you really need to start thinking beyond, you know, talking with people in your own staff rooms and your own local community. You must, in this day and age where we're all communicating on Twitter and um, uh, Facebook and illumination and uh, wikis and blogs and whatever else. Um, if you're not part of a, a network of professional people um, who are discussing the issues that you're having in your own local environment, well, I don't believe you're really serious about solving the problems. I really think that it's an absolute necessity that you, you have a look and that you encourage everyone in your staff to have a look and to have a, a professional learning network outside. Um, the people at their desk, um, you know, or in their immediate office. And of course I'm recommending, um, we've got the fabulous Moby MOOC here at the moment with hundreds of people around the world signed up who will come back at some stage I'm sure and listen to this presentation. Um, but a good practical place is our slide to learning um, with people around the world in there as well. Um, you really need to have your leadership on board wherever you are, whether you're in a school or any other kind of institution. If the boss doesn't understand it, it's not going anywhere. Uh, some of the places where mobility and learning, I've seen some great successes. Places like um, Colbert Middle School in North Carolina where Susan Wells is the principal and after introducing iPod Dutchess to a small group of advanced students in her school, it just went so well that you know they've got six, eight hundred now out there in the school, and um, because of her belief in the power of the mobility and the learning, it has moved a long way. And um, the same goes for um, Abdul Chohan and the Easter Academy in Bolton, where again they took a very brave move to overcome uh, public perceptions and to to try and think of the student and what their needs were and what a key ingredient for success that the mobile learning would provide to turn the results for their students around and they achieved just that. Um, they, they had you know, massive improvements in their GCSE results in the UK. Uh, they were using resources from GCSE pod which are downloadable uh, podcasts to assist students with um, their exams which were which were really successful but it, it was a one to one 24 hours a day, seven days a week driven by school leadership. It's, uh, it, it's just basically like a recipe for success. Um, number eight, take responsibility within your curriculum for explicitly teaching mobile capability to appropriate use. You know, if the answer all the time is to ban things uh, we're, we're not going to move forward with this. And so you need to learn. If you don't know what it can do, and the people in your schools are, you know, wanting to, you know, cry foul of mobile devices and they don't know what to do with them, um, ask them, do they know what to do with them? Because I think most of the time they'll find they've got no idea and they're not going away, they're not going anywhere, and we really need to have uh, a lot more understanding of that within any of our learning systems. And the last point, and this will link in with what Malcolm wants to do, uh, and the next generation of mobile learning is all about peer-generated content, uh, linking into cloud resources of course, augmenting the learning, contextual learning which is um, learning which 
provides extra multimedia resources or searchability or connectivity or collaboration in, in a place that that person is, whether they're geocaching or whether they're in a museum or an art gallery or whether they're on some kind of you know expedition which is making use of the sensors in the mobile device or projecting some kind of augmented reality um, onto something in the real world to gather further information about that, that object. Uh, the, the results there are, are just endless. And just remembering and uh, you know coming back to that point I made before that uh, you know if you're looking at um, CV, CPD in schools, you know uh, we, we really need to have people employed in schools who are responsible for um, connecting teaching and learning and, and helping the, the people in our schools to get it across. So the, um, the most valuable resource that I believe is, is the imagination of teachers to be able to move things, these things forward and show people a new way of thinking about mobility and, instead of it just being a distraction. Now a couple of places that you might want to look, I have recommended the, um, I have recommended the, the NING. Um, I have also written hundreds of thousands of words over the past three years about everything that I've done in the classroom. So if you've got a really deep mug of coffee or tea, um, log on to my blog and have a read back through what's been put there over the last three years. Um, a lot of interesting things. I'm, I'm sure there's bound to be something in there, there that will be of interest to anyone in any field with mobile learning. Um, and please don't hesitate to contact me and ask any questions. And lastly, I would like to quote this. This is from a lady who I haven't met, but I picked this up from the, the MOOC. There was a petition that was put up online um, a few weeks ago about a statement that was made by um, Michael Gove in the UK about the possibility of banning mobile devices. And uh, she, she wrote this, and this is a really powerful statement, so um, I would like to thank Maggie for this one. But as you can read there, mobile devices are powerful computers in children's pockets. We should let them use the technology they have and guide them how to do it wisely. Like learning to cross a road, we don't ban students from, from kids from learning to cross a road because we're frightened. We, we teach them how to look left and how to look right and we guide them along until they're responsible enough to do it by themselves. And if, if we as educators uh, don't teach our children to be responsible digital citizens, who will? And um, at that particular point, I would like to thank you for your um, attendance this evening and open up the room for any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I shall put up a smile for that. Thank you. Any questions from anyone? I suppose it's, it's a bit mind-boggling at the moment, especially if you're new to this idea. Uh, okay, so a couple of things. Uh, I'll do the blog one first because that's quick and easy. Uh. Okay, there's that um, blog URL. <coughs> what would I do differently if I did it again? I would... Um, the difficult situation I found myself in was we started off with the mobile learning and then we had a big push from our federal and our state government to deliver one-to-one -one, um, netbook, notebook computers in our school and that became a very big focus and so the power of mobility was actually lost. Uh, I, I don't know, I think I would be trying to get uh, the leadership to understand more of, of how this is something that it's not going away. I think even three years ago, people didn't realise that you know mobile devices uh, weren't just going away. They're going to become more powerful and have more and more uses, um, and that's that's not stopping. And I think I would have liked to have got that message across. And so that'd be a message if I was looking to start anything, is to do that research and and let people know that you know this is the world that we live in, and we need to be responsible for 
for teaching this and, and to ensure that the resources were provided um, to deliver that training. Uh, in terms of working with the kids, you know, I'm really proud of, of what we've done and what we've achieved and what we've learnt through uh, applying it in different ways. So, um, not a lot. That's great. Thanks very much. I've got that. I'll go and look you both up now. Well, thank you all of you for um, joining us this evening and please um, put the word out to anyone else who might be interested in this presentation and um, I'm sure Andy will, will post out where people can get it from, from the MOOC. So thanks very much for your time this evening. Good night. <laughs>